My name is Jean Baptiste, and I'm the president of the Vidola Nonprofit. JB, it's so awesome to have you on the show. Uh, we are very familiar, of course, with your work and through VLC and all of the projects you're involved in. So I am, uh, you know, really honored actually to be able to talk with you. And why don't you start by? Uh, I think everyone's familiar <laughs> with Video Land and, and and with VLC in particular. But give us a really quick history of, uh, you know, how it came to be, and yeah. So, so people know about VLC, but they don't really know about Videoland. And a lot of people mix them, right? So, um, and that's okay, right? Because VLC is the most popular part of Videoland. But there are other projects of Videoland because Videoland is a nonprofit. And like X264 or David, but a lot of other software that are libraries and people don't know about them. So it's, and all comes down with the history of Videoland. The story of Videoland is a really weird one. Uh, because like there is no one that decided to do VLC. Um, it's a, a process that started in the late eighties that became that did like a few projects that arrived at the thing that was VLC. So how did it start? So it, at the Ecole Centrale Paris, which is one of the uni university in south of Paris, the the network was managed by the students, and since the eighties. And the students wanted to have a faster network uh, because they wanted to play video games in 1993, 1994. And because the students managed networks, the university didn't want to pay for a network upgrade. So they were like a bit blocked about that. And how can we um, have a new network? And they went to see like a few, because the university didn't want to pay for that, they went to see like a few partners and they were one partner, which was a TV station, a French TV station called TF1. And they said, well, the future of video is satellite. Okay, well, now we know that it's not. But yeah. in 1905, you know, why not, right? Sure. And what they wanted is that to be able to stream only with like one satellite dish and one satellite decoder for the 2,000 people who were on the campus and not have 2,000 dishes and 2,000 satellite decoders. And they wanted to use a network because, well, it was digital, so it should work on the network. And th they had this token ring 10 megabit network, which was, of course, not enough. But they say, well, if you do that, we'll pay for the network upgrade. And the students who wanted to play video games say, okay, sure, we'll do that. It, it seems obvious today, but at the time, like the, the faster was Pentium 90, and most people, most students had a 486DX at 33 megahertz. So yeah. doing MPEG-2 decoding, even in SD real-time, like you had those huge cars that costed like hundreds of francs or a few I remember. dollars. And, <laughs> and that was absolutely not possible, not doable, yeah. right? So they discussed about like decoding only once and send raw video with a very small codec and so on. But so this project was like, a bit insane, right? 1995, 1996. But they did it. And basically, they did this really cool demo for this project, which was called Network 2000. Um, and the project could have stopped there. And actually, it did stop there. But after, there was a demo. Everything worked. 30 seconds. Everything was crashing. Everyone was happy. But one year after, in 1998, there was a few students who said, well, you know what? Like, maybe people could use that to stream video on a network. And that's how it became Video LAN. This was not open source. Um, this was not cross-platform. Um, it took them two years to convince the university to change the license of the software to GPL, and they did it in 2001. And based on that, some people who are not at the school, not at the university, uh, people, one was in England and one was in Netherlands, one ported it to Windows and, and the other ported it to, to, to Mac OS. But mm. this was just a client, right? The solution mm -hmm. was a lot more. There was a server, there was some networking, they did some weird multicast thing on an ATM network. And so th there was lots of part of the video land solution. And one of it was the video land client, which was not the most complex at that time. Mm. But because it was able to play MPEG 2, someone in integrated like DVD playback and then someone else, well, added like uh, uh, DivX support. And yeah. because it was open source, people started adding new features and so on. And, and this video on the client became VLC and like mm -hmm. no one cared that much about the whole complete solution. So mm -hmm. um, 
And because it was done at the beginning on Linux, where you have the packaging of all together, and it was done by porting a Linux packaging, you didn't use those codec packs, right? So everything was inside the binary on, on Windows and Mac. And that's how VLC became very popular. And also because VLC was a network player and is a network player, it was yeah. very resistant to errors and broken files. And at that time, when you were downloading things in peer-to-peer, -peer, that was very important. So yes. what, what's interesting is that no one designed VLC to be like, oh, I'm going to do a new player that is going to play everything and it's going to be cross-platform. Because VLC yeah. is a small part of the VideoLand project, which is a, a small part, the, the continuation, open source continuation of a project which was like, new do a new network because like in the 1980s they had a token ring network that was mm -hmm. very slow and they wanted to play video games um and because of that video land uh became like uh, um, first a student group um and in 2003 there was x264 that was started over there mm -hmm. but it's it, it's a weird a weird beginning uh but then it becomes a non-profit, but Vidalan stores a lot of uh, uh, multimedia open source projects. Mm, interesting. Now, at what point did you get involved? So uh, actually, uh, I arrived at the Ecole Centrale Paris in 2003, and I was a kind of VP of uh, the, the network, or the student network. Mm -hmm. And Vidalan was actually a part of this non-profit managing the network. And so I started by basically doing broadcasting mostly on, on the on the server side, which was yeah. at the beginning Videoland server and Videoland client, which was streaming mm -hmm. files. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how I started with VLC. But uh, I actually spent more time starting in 2005 and six when I was actually leaving the school and I was in uh, extremely boring internships where I had nothing to do. And I was just like, hey, what can I do? And so yeah. because of my, most of my friends were working on VLC, I was just like, okay, let's do that. Yeah, let's work on that. Wow, that's that's amazing. So you started almost 20 years ago, 19, uh, 19 years yeah. ago or so? So after that, I created the Vidola Nonprofit in 2007, 2008, mm. where I took most of the assets around all the Vidola projects VLC mm -hmm. being one, but X264 mm -hmm. and uh, libdvd CSS and a lot of things. And I started a lot of other projects around the Videoland nonprofit and the Videoland profit is doing a lot more than VLC today. In bootstrapping, uh, new codec standards. Uh, tell us about David and, um, you know, how that project came to be and what it is. I think every, our audience knows, but uh, anyway, tell us about David. So, so David is, so this very fast AV1 decoder, um, but it's one of the most impressing, impressive software I know, and people mm -hmm. don't realize it, right? So yes. um, it's basically a collaboration with people from Videoland, people from FFmpeg, and people from Two Orioles, which is a company doing a mm -hmm. VP9 and AV1 encoder. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we were absolutely not happy with the, the, the the state of uh, the open source format decoders. Mm -hmm. um, the, the VP9 decoder was not as good. And when one became into FFmpeg, it was a lot faster. And there is a good reason for that because it's extremely difficult to define a new standard and have something that actually works and then something that is prediction ready. Mm -hmm. Especially because uh, when you look at the energy spent, a lot of the energy spent is on all those machines, right? With the mm -hmm. screen and the decoders and so on. So we wanted mm -hmm. to have something that was extremely efficient because we thought it was important, especially because at the beginning, people were start fighting against AV1 saying, oh, well, it's too complex to decode. No mm -hmm. one can do that in real time, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Things that we heard every time, right? When mm -hmm. H264 was out, I remember, yeah, it's going to be too slow. Exactly. When it's, oh, it's, it's going to be too yeah. slow. Yeah. Oh, everyone is out, yeah. it's going to be slow. <laughs> like, yeah. like, come on, guys, like, you've seen that five times. You know how yes. it's going. It's not. Yes. But our goal was to say that we wanted to have something that was very quickly there um, and, like, n absolutely, um, like, every cycle counts. Mm -hmm. And because you need to bootstrap somewhere. And mm -hmm. it's a chicken and egg problem, right? You don't have hardware decoders, mm -hmm. so people don't encode in this format. And because people don't encode in this format, well, uh, they don't because they have no one that is able to play, right? Mm -hmm. So we thought mm -hmm. that having something that was integrated very quickly in VLC and FFmpeg was just like, mm -hmm. sure, it's not going to be amazing mm -hmm. uh, compared to hardware decoders, but it's going to be 
quite good. Mm -hmm. And the result we see today was that in many cases, even for software decoding, some, sometimes the software decoders are faster and mm -hmm. use less power than the hardware uh, decoders yes. for a, a lot of reasons, right? So the, the bet, I think, is won. Um, and um, yeah, so we launched this project. We had a lot of uh, uh, monetary help from uh, the Alliance for Open Media, uh, mm -hmm. who gave uh, the, the initial money. And then uh, because they thought that we arrived at something that was decent, then we got mm -hmm. like extra funding from a few companies uh, directly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's people don't realize how insane David is, right? So let, let yeah. me explain that. David is around 30,000 lines of T. Mm -hmm. 30,000 lines of T. It's tricky, right? But it's, we're not talking about something so out of line, right? Yeah. But it's 190,000 line of handwritten assembly. Handwritten wow. assembly, right? In wow. 2020, 2021, I didn't know that. people are writing assembly yeah. by hand. Um, and it's... To give you, there is more assembly in David than in the whole FFmpeg for the whole other formats, right? Wow. It's insane. Um, why is that so big? Because we support five architectures, ARM mm -hmm. v7, ARM v8. Um, we use Intel 32 bits, um, mm -hmm. and which is SSE3, um, mm -hmm. and Intel 64 bits, basically, mm -hmm. uh, AVX2. But yeah. we also support SSE3 with 64 bits because... Um, most of the console uh, don't support AVX2. Mm -hmm. but, so that's five architectures, and you need to code for them. But then at the same time, you need to support 8-bit decoding. But today, yeah. right, like a new architect needs to have 10-bit or 12-bit. Yes. Yeah. And so, well, we have and like everything that we could accelerate, we did. Um, so it, it's like I don't know any software, open source or non-open source, wow. that in in the last few years I've yeah. written and has so much assembly because yeah. like even if MPEG has less but sure. also that most of it was written in less than two years by Amazing. a couple of people right? yeah so how big is, I was going to ask how big was the team that developed it five ten wow something like that right? yeah yeah yeah, I and, love and it. And of course, it, work, it runs on iOS, Android. Well, because Absolutely. like video land, yeah. and because well, I need it for VLT, right? So yes, by default, yes. it's on all platforms. Yeah, not, it has to say, support all platforms. Oh no, you know this one is small. I don't care. No, we do care, right? Uh, yeah, VLT yeah. is on more platform than yeah. than Chrome or than yeah. Office, right? It's yeah. on, Absolutely. in our DNA, right? Yeah. So we do that. That's amazing. I had no idea about all that handwritten uh, assembly. No idea. And, and the thing is, like, you talk about handwritten, and every time you speak about handwritten assembly, people are say, yeah, but you know, uh, you shouldn't do that, right? Because compilers <laughs> are faster, right? Every yeah. single time you hear that, right? Yeah. And so we, yeah. like, maybe, let's, so let's try. In yeah. average, on many functions, we are four to five times faster than wow. anything else, even when <laughs> it's like... Uh, uh, Oh, we use not use this version of CLang, so we use this version of GCC or CLang or ICC, and no, oh, you need to use all those options. We took all those options, right? We are faster, um, yeah. and there was uh, so compared to the original decoder from AOM, which was developed um, during the process, mm -hmm. and this is absolutely normal, right? We are mm -hmm. often three to four times faster, right? We're sure. not talking about thirty sure. percent; it's just a plus two hundred percent. And the sure. AOM decoder was absolutely not ridiculous, right? It was. Yeah pretty good compared to what was done on, on VP9 and people learn about that. But mm -hmm. one, you, once you have a fixed target, right, not yeah. everything is moving, you can yeah. try to get exactly the perfect architecture um, and like win every cycle. You can cheat mm -hmm. because you know mm -hmm. what the specs allows, right? That's you know right. that, oh, this, you, you know that you, like this one is not going to saturate because else the AV1 stream is invalid, so you can cheat yeah. there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And there is also the fact that we have a, a, the thre threading on, on David is extremely complex because mm -hmm. you have slice threading, frame threading, mm -hmm. there is the post filter threading, um, mm -hmm. and and of course the film grain threading. And most people don't, um, a lot of people who use David directly in the software had lots of difficulty setting all those because it depends on the input and so on. So mm -hmm. um, that was done so that you can actually, if you know what you're doing, you can 
have the maximum power uh, yeah. for, 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 for the software. Yeah, that's great. Uh, y- you know, I think uh, I love it that you're pointing out the fact that d- it, d- David actually outperforms or, you know, you made the comment early on that software can outperform even hardware. And, yeah, so, and so that, that, that's, that's a good, let's talk good about question. that because yeah, I think yeah. that's counterintuitive. And I think even some of our audience who uh, our audience are mostly deep experts, but I don't think everybody either believes that or knows it. <laughs> well, it's because it depends, right? It depends yeah. on the hardware, right? But especially right. for like the, the, the problem is that um, some complex CPUs, because most of the formats, right? They are mm-hmm. on the CPU and GPU, but they are not CPU and GPU, right? It's a DSP, right? right? It's written right. exactly for that. And sometimes yeah. you need to turn it on and yeah. this turning on this this part of the CPU or the yeah. GPU is going to yeah. have like a, a bigger power while when you can decode 240p or 360p, That's maybe, right. you know, like it's going to be similar. Sometimes yeah. it's slower, it's rarely smaller, yeah. but it happens, right? We had yeah. some tests and then you're going to say, oh, well, it's a bug in the CPU. Yeah. Sure, but the yeah. CPU is out, right? It's on the phone. What can you do, right? Yeah, um, it, exactly. It's like, <laughs> like there, there was a bug. I think it was on Samsung uh, devices where the VP9 decoder on hardware is mismanaging one of the features of VP9. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what are you going to do? Well, you disable it, right? Because there is hundreds of million people who have this bug, right? Yeah. So <laughs> we, we had this case where when you compare, and that was mostly true for lower resolutions, mm-hmm. that sometimes, well, the, the hardware decoding was was drawing more power because it was mm-hmm. turning on another part of the chip or or mm-hmm. big cores because like it's for lots of reasons and yeah. that can happen yes yeah um, yeah amazing. but it's also more important than that is that to realize that you can achieve and that's true it's mostly on lower resolution yeah. similar consumption um, yeah. there and that's pretty cool because then what's costing you is the backlight of the screen yeah. Yeah, that's right. And and this is really interesting. Of course, I spend most of my time uh, professionally day to day on the encoding side. Uh, but I'm always happy to talk about decoding because, you know, it's the it's the chicken and the egg. Right. So I can create the bit stream. But if you can't play it back anywhere, it doesn't matter. And um, I, I know that, you know, we get in conversations all the time around AV1 or any new standard. And it always goes like this, you know, with a customer. Yes, we know it's really great. We know it has an advantage. Maybe they've tested, maybe not. But, you know, generally there's acknowledgement like, yes, we're really excited. But come back and talk to us when you've got this ecosystem and that ecosystem and when Qualcomm is supported and when Apple's supported, you know, they have their long list. Right. And um, I and I and we always come back with AV1. What's beautiful and with David is we can always come back and say, hey, guys, did you know that this player, David, is so powerful and so efficient that AV1 is de- being deployed on some of the lowest end devices using software decoding uh, in in markets that you would think that'd be the last place, <laughs> you know, that uh, it's being deployed and. That's and, counterintuitive. And it's it's... Well, there are cases and in, in, in markets where like having a lower bandwidth is so much more important, right? Because yes. infrastructure is not there yes. or because um, there is a lot of data cap. And because when you have a cell phone, like the biggest consumption of power is your screen and your 4G chip, right? That's right. Um, that's right. And when you play back video, right? So that's important. And also yeah. like I envision and that what I said at the beginning is that you will always need a software decoder as a backup, right? So let's do mm-hmm. one that is efficient when mm-hmm. we can do it. But mm-hmm. you, what is true is that the amount of time spent on um, the software decoder is huge. And so it's a lot of resources, um, mm-hmm. in my opinion. But yeah. I think that the ecosystem needs to do that for every new format. It does. Because if you it don't does. have... Right, and it needs to be on a very liberal license, right? MIT. You want to modify it? Modify it. Like, do yeah. it. My goal is that the format is out, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that um, to speak about something else, and David, like um, the VVC project actually understood that for once, right? So mm-hmm. the VVC decoder and encoder that was out of the MPEG VVC consortium mm-hmm. is actually something that is good, right? Not like in HVC times where you had like something that. Well, you couldn't do anything about it, right? Yeah. So um, 
coming fast on production is important, especially since, well, 85% of the streams are still at 264. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Wow. Amazing. Well, so uh, is there anything coming next for David? And uh, what so can we you tell us? David, we released David 1.0 uh, not so long ago. We are fixing mm -hmm. a few stuff. Um, there are a couple of functions that could be faster, and we're working on that. But basically, the main work is done. Um, what we could do, uh, and is something I would like to do, but currently I don't have the resources to do it, is to start to do a hybrid decoder, mm. which means CPU and GPU. Mm. Especially like on David, like the if you activate Film Brain, we give you the pixel shaders uh, that mm -hmm. you can run inside your application so that the, mm -hmm. the pixel shader is applied, the filter is applied on the GPU. And mm -hmm. a lot of phones have like very good GPUs or they're not that good to do complex video games. Sure. They're good enough to apply in a, 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 a pixel. Um, and when you see a, a AV1, you, there are a lot of loop restoration, post filters with a film grain, SGR, mm -hmm. Viner, and, and, mm -hmm. and so on. And some of those could could be um, offloaded to the GPU. It's not, it's absolutely not going to increase the number of FPS. Mm -hmm. I might think that on many devices, it's going to lower the number of FPS. Mm -hmm. um, but as soon as you hit 60 FPS, you don't care, right? But what yeah, you could right. improve is the number of FPS per watt, right? So mm -hmm. especially because the, the, the filter, which are the last parts of the AV1 decoding process, Mm -hmm. are very similar on all those pixels. So like mm -hmm. GPUs are pretty good at doing that. They so are. you could expect yeah. that the, the first part, which is like entropy coding, uh, motion compensation and so on, is done yeah. mostly on the CPU. And at some point in the, the mid decoding, you will move to, to, to GPU. This is extremely rare because most of the time you do either a full GPU decoder like the one that I've been for, done for mm -hmm. JPEG, uh, JPEG 2000, uh, full, GPU, full GPU decoders, or there was also a Navy one which was doing everything on the GPU. Mm -hmm. um, having a hybrid decoder as open source, I, I, I don't think it's ever done. Uh, the problem is that here we are not talking about just implementation. We're talking about actually R&D uh, yeah, and we right. need to have someone and I don't have the resources on video land yeah. to have someone that, hey, you yeah. know what, I'm going to spend six months to one year having fun. But I think it's necessary for the ecosystem sure. Um, sure. because I think people are changing phone less and less. So the, yes. the, the renewal of the machines is going to go slower. Um, like when I watch my mom with a five-year-old phone, uh, six-year-old PC, and say, well, you should change it. She's like, no, it's fine. Like, so uh, having those kind of like hybrid decoding so that you can decrease the, 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 the power consumption is mm -hmm. important. Yeah, yeah, amazing. So I, I can't tell you it's next because like currently I, I'm not sure I'm going to do it, but I think that's the next big thing we could do around it. Yeah, yeah. How so? Would you go out and get sponsorship? I mean, it sounds like David was like you said it was initially uh, funded from the AOM. <laughs> Yeah, and then like, a handful the, the, of other the, companies. Huh? Sure. But the, the founding was mostly like something that is sure, right? They need something, right? So sure. They, CEO, they have, yeah, like, that I want easy. this, right? Yeah. And when you said, you know what? Like, uh, I would try GPU decoding. Would it work? I, I think so. No. How do you know? Yeah. Well, I think so. Trust <laughs> we me. have to build it. <laughs> yeah, right? so, so, so that's, that's why it's a bit more difficult to find yeah. sponsorship and, and resources. Got it. That. Got it. Got it. Now, so your commercial model, um, I know you're a nonprofit. Uh, so do you literally just, you, you know, you raise enough money to pay your, pay your team and pay the team working on a project or what, what does that look like? How does that work? Exactly? Vigilant has no money, right? We pay no one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Got it. there is no business model around Vigilant. No. Yeah. Right? And so, so you're an administrator is... of these projects. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, yeah. And that allows full independence, right? So that yeah, you can that's do... right. right. And what you see around that, and FFmpeg is the same, right? But mm -hmm. what you see around is a few companies which are basically consulting company around that, right? And I yes, created one okay. called Video Labs uh, around VLC. I created one around FFmpeg lately, which is called FF Labs. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, and there are a few other people in the community who are either sure. consultant and so on. 
And because we have those commercial entities, those are able to take contracts. And sure. David was one of the contracts. Sure. But it's mostly like it's the outlier. Most of the time, yeah. it doesn't happen like that. But yeah. of course, if you want to have something that is like extremely focused like David and like in one year and a half have a decoder and two years have the fastest decoder ever, sure. then of course, you need resources. And then you use those kind of yeah. very common thing you see on open source, which is commercial company who works. That's right. Um, and, and there is a lot of people around the video line yeah. FFmpeg community who actually do that. Got it. Got it. Wow. Amazing. Well, thank you for giving all the details behind uh, David. You know, I, I I started out by saying that, you know, I wanted to talk about David. I also wanted to talk, maybe uh, have a little more sort of philosophical type, type conversation, not really uh, philosophical, but to say that it's so important for a new codex standard that this role of, uh, of having an open source, highly performant, decoder, you know, that really works because without that, you know, you can have the greatest encoders. It can be a really great standard, but, but it's ultimately going to fail because you can't yeah, play because, back the bitstream, you know? And, and you need, you need at yeah. the beginning to have a, a decoder that works everywhere because that's right. It's like, you have like an ecosystem and like, not everyone has the same type of platforms, but yeah. like, if you want to reach out, um, you need to, to have everything, especially yeah. since, like, let's be honest, H.264 was amazing, right? When you move yes. from MPEG-2, and then what, right? Oh, wh what is it good with HEVC? Well, it's great for 4K. I don't have a 4K screen. I don't care, yeah. right? Yeah. So you need to, it's like when you move from VHS to DVD, right? Like the change was yeah. in usage was huge, right? When you yeah. change from DVD from Blu-rays, what is a Blu-ray? Well, it's a DVD extra HD, right? Yeah. That's it. That's how you define yeah. it. Yeah, but having DVDs where you have chapters like multiple videos, multiple angles, you can you don't have to rewind your VHS, yeah. and that's the yeah. same what that happened with H.264. H.264 was like a huge leap, and yes. then you need to be a ton better, right, to, to change it. And for example, HVC completely failed, completely mm -hmm. failed. It's a, mm -hmm. a completely, it's an error, and of course, the people from MPEG are going no, it's great, it's great. Yeah. It's a complete failure. It's a complete failure compared to the amount of money that was invented, invested. That's right. That's um, right. It, even in open source, right? VP8 or VP9 did not get the traction they, they should mm -hmm. have had, right? Everyone mm -hmm. is, in my opinion, the, the, the continuation and learn about the issues um, that, yes. that, you, that they were. But it's important because you need everyone to be able to play your streams because then you, it costs money on networking, on encoding time, on storage right. and so on. So you, right so it, it decoders and today it's quite funny right because yeah. there is vvc av1 um sometimes in a few years av2 you have yeah. mpeg uh, uh evc which EVC, is like the low yeah. the, the low version of vvc but it's also baseline and not baseline which which yeah. is confusing and then yeah. you get the mpeg5 lc evc which yeah. is not really a codec but it's a, um, yeah. a codec that is actually an announcement layer of uh, all the codecs and so yeah. like are you going to build all those inside your DSPs or on your mm. chips? Are you yeah. going to, to waste 1 billion um, yeah. transistor on each of those formats? What about encoding, right? Yeah. Uh, when are you going to drop MPEG-2 decoding in hardware or encoder in hardware, right? Mm -hmm. right? Th so those trade-offs are important. And it's you have to fix your licensing, right? So, but yeah. Sure. If you don't, then That's you right. get the HEVC problem. Uh, but you need to have very good... Um, Decoders. And for example, on HVC, it's fun, but the FFmpeg HVC uh, decoder is in many cases slower and less good than than the, the AV11 because we spent less time on it. Right? That's right. So it, That's right. if you want your format to be popular, and yeah, you don't care about piracy, you don't care about UGC content, you don't care. But those people are the ones who are going to buy your devices and make it out, right? And That's you right. are not alone, right? There are many formats, so you need to compete. Thank you so much for coming on. And I know that uh, we're going to do a part two. Uh, so uh, I'm really super excited to hear about the projects that you have coming up. But um, this concludes the David discussion. And uh, thank you again. Thank you, JB. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.